Hello everyone, my name is Christian and welcome to my talk entitled C++ Love Python from modules to hybrid application. Before starting, I just wanted to say thanks to PyCon and the PSF for giving us the speakers the opportunity to share our talks with you all in this new online format. I really hope you enjoy. I have prepared many little examples uh, and we will start playing around with C Python, writing our own modules and start to integrate some features of C++ in Python modules. And last but not least, there is a large example that you can integrate a real C++ application with some Python scripting. I really hope that you enjoyed the talk and afterwards you can download the code and try it by yourself. So let's start. C++, well, you are thinking we're on conference to talk about C++? I don't think so. I really believe that C++ and Python has uh, many uh, things in common and of course a couple of differences. So on the similarity side, you know that both languages are general purpose, they are multi-paradigm, of course supporting functional programming a bit, um, but also there are some differences and these are the most uh, straightforward ones that in, of course in C++ you need to compile, everything is statically typed so you have uh, types at the time of compiling but in the difference with Python that everything is interpreted and uh, it's a dynamical language. But we usually hear the argument C++ is too difficult, but it is fast. And on the other side we hear Python is so easy, but kind of slow. So which one do we choose then? That's a good thing. We don't need to choose one. And I will explain this thing in a bit. So let's take a step back and try to analyze why Python is so amazing at the moment. I firmly believe that Python is nice because of two main reasons. The first one is because it was heavily inspired in the ABC programming language. If you're not familiar with it, try to read that code with your Python knowledge. You can understand it. Because as you can see, the syntax is quite similar to what we have now. And the second aspect is it because it was written in C. I know that there are some modules that are written in Python itself inside the C Python implementation, but it's written in C and the core is C. So using this old language that for some people would be like, oh, this is too complicated. I don't, I don't really need to even learn about it. We will have a free pass to other languages because many other languages are either written in C or have some nice compatibility with C. So when I'm saying using C, of course, it's kind of idea of glue, right? You will have some new functionalities that you would like to add to Python. Maybe you have some small function in, in C that you want to expose to Python. Also, you can have performance things, I don't know, doing some crazy uh, approach uh, with uh, GPU computing, for example, connecting some, some code that, I don't know, can parallelize the task of uh, heavy task of processing files and so on. Or maybe you just have a library written in C or other languages that is C-friendly and you want to expose it to Python. Of course, there are many other crazy ideas to do uh, while using C, but uh, if you think that this is kind of weird still to use it in Python, just give you a couple of examples. NumPy. If you didn't know, NumPy backend is mainly written in Fortran and C. That's why it's so efficient, that's why it's so nice. If you go uh, then to Pandas, Pandas is relying on NumPy and Besides most of the functionality being in Python, there are a few things in C. So, for example, the parser that they are using when they are dealing with, uh, when you are reading, for example, CSV files. That's why it's so fast, that's why it's so efficient. And you have more modern modules like PyTorch, for example, that is just exposing this huge C library, which is Torch, to Python, plus adding some new features on top of it. So these ideas are not really weird and we can see that most popular Python modules sometimes have some small little folder there with some C uh, files that can are providing some functionality. So why C++ then? Because I truly believe that C++ and Python can help each other in many ways. And how do I know? I have been the last two years working on a project called the Qt project, uh, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a cross-platform C++ framework. Uh, where you can have UI components, you can build UI for different systems. It's cross-platform because you can use the same code uh, and run it on Windows, Mac, Linux, and of course you have compatibilities with iOS, Android, and so on and so forth. But more particularly, I have been working on a project called Qt for Python. Maybe you heard of PySide, um, which is a, a project that aims to expose this huge C++ framework 
to Python. I say huge because it's a really old framework that has been evolving with the years. Qt has, it has more or less the same age as Python, so <clears throat> there's a lot of things there that need to be exposed and treated um, properly to Python. So if you're not familiar with C++, I would like to give you now one slide that at least will help, help you to understand C++ code, or at least basic components. On the right you can see Python code, and on the left you will see C++ code. So there you have it, some difference with the comments, and the major difference there is that uh, you need to specify types for each uh, line and variable that you have in C++. So you have int, floats, strings, vectors of ints, which is similar to a list, the same idea with functions, instead of braces in C++, you have the coloring in Python, but you don't have the def, but you need to specify the return type, which in case is, is uh, integer. If you're familiar with type annotation, maybe you, this is not so complicated for you to understand. And the main, that one mimics in Python with name is equal to main, it's mandatory in C++, and you need to have it. And you can have there the call of the same function odd and printing something out as a result. The extra, strep, the extra step, of course, is when you Python you execute it directly. In C++, you need to compile first and then execute the binary. So that's it. You already are now prepared to read any C++ code and understand. I understand this is not the whole language features, but at least now you are more familiar with it if you didn't know it before, and you have some grasp of uh, the things that you will be approaching, and I will be showing here. C++ has been evolving since uh, any programming language, and um, in the latest uh, releases, uh, all these are every, every three years, there have been many features that on one side are really useful for C++ developer, and the other side also, they look really Pythonic, or at least they follow the same philosophy of making things simpler. For example, C++11, you have the autotype, which is kind of when you are compiling, it infers, they say, okay, the first one is a float, and the second is a string, which is kind of handy. Tuples, you can create tuples and also unpack tuples in different variables. The, of course, Python dictionary is a quite usable structure. You can also have it in C++, it's another map. I know it's more verbose, you need to specify more types, but it's still possible to do. And you can get the values, of course, using the different keys there uh, and another auto value. And lambdas, you can put lambdas everywhere also now with these empty braces um, syntax. And you can put any functions there, here and there, to improve your, your code. So let's go a little bit further to C14. Uh, you can now use auto as a return type. There you can define also some vari variable templates. Like in this case, I can use t as an int or float or double instead of to see how much precision do I need for my p value. You can also have binary literals and even digit separators. I don't know in Python you can use underscore here, you can use the single quote. In C17, you have the options to return more than one value, like for example here in a par in a pair, and uh, unpack these values into two separate variables x and y, which is kind of nice, and also you have it in Python. In Python dictionaries, again, the same way that we iterate them, which is really handy, like for key value in dictionary.items, you can have a similar approach here. And the last standard, which is C20, has two really nice features that I really like. The first one is the modules. You can see on the left side, you are declaring a module in a file and exporting this module called simple and exporting some functions, in this case, hello. For using the module, then you need to import simple. It sounds familiar. This is really a Python, in my opinion. And then in the main, you can just call the function that you have there. The second feature that I want to highlight is our ranges. You can declare first an integers ranges, you know, simple number sequence, two lambda functions to determine if something in number is even, and another one to elevate number to the power of two. And you can start to connect all these different functions to your vector of integers. So you can see there in the fourth, you are iterating ints, but then you are saying, but filter the numbers, only the evens, and then with the remainders, filter that, transform it, and get the square of those numbers, which is really cool. I haven't used these uh, features in production yet, but uh, I am really looking forward to, to have some project that uses this. New operators. 
you saw all the amazing things with the Walrus operator that was introduced in Python 8. And uh, believe it or not, also in C++20, there is a new operator. Kind of funny, even. It's a spacious operator. I will not go into details here, but it's just a comparison between two objects, which is kind of nice, see? Even two languages has the same new fancy operators. OK, but enough for the slides. I would like to jump now into the terminal and show you some code. And uh, first of all, uh, we will have two different scenarios. The first one is C++ help in Python. For this, I would like to show you now some C Python code just to get familiar with it and two little implementations of a couple of functions. And for the second, I will not spoil it yet. So uh, let's open a terminal now. I will just put it here and of course leave it aside. You will have access to this repository, of course. So please download and get the code and try it by yourself. <clears throat> we are going to code, activate in my environment, and let's go to the CPython. So for, to start writing your own module in CPython, you need a couple of um, uh, structures. So just to give you an idea what you will need, don't worry about it, I will not write too much code here. You will need the module initialization. You will need to have before that a module declaration. Before you will have functions declarations. And here you will have the implementation of your functions. Like, let's say you want to implement a function. Forget, I mean, if you're not familiar with CPython, don't worry about it. Um, for example, you have static, uh, simple, hello. You will, I will not put the, the arguments there, but you will have a functions that then uh, will return. Like, for example, I have a, a message. And then I will return it. And then this function hello, I will put it here <coughs> somehow. And I will keep this in, in some variable. And then in the model declaration, I will say, hey, the functions use ff. And then a model declaration. Sounds simple? It is simple. And that's why this file is called simple. As you can see here, you have the module initialization, just one line inside a pi module create. Here you have the module definition. Take these structures as boxes that you need to fill with different values. You have the name, the dog, and the methods that you want to use. Oh, what is simple functs? You go up, simple functs. Simple functs, yet another box to fill. A name of a function. What is the C function that I will need to call underneath? In this case, the simple hello, and this function has no argument and some documentation. If you see here, this is the same thing that we already implemented and that will be it. This will allow you to create, well, of course you will need two lines of a setup there, like just to say, hey, this is a C extension. And you will be able to run something like this. So to install and to execute, and there you have it. Your first C function written uh, the C function that is exposed to Python. So I thought, okay, what else can I do? Once I was working uh, with some data and managing many files, so I did the typical glob glob of everything, but I did it recursively, and it th and it took a lot of time. And I thought maybe I can have something faster to implement. So I thought. What if I don't go to see uh, to a module and I write my own C extension using a nice feature from C++ that is called um, type system. So this is a really cool thing from the standard library and you can see it here. I'm using it here right now. The structure of this is the same thing you just saw. Module initialization, definition, the same with the functions, and here I have the one that's called fast glove. glove. This is the function. Forget about these lines. These are just parsing the arguments because, of course, I will receive an expression and then an option that is if it's recursive or not. I will create an empty list. I will use this nice iterator that I told you in a recursive way or in a non-recursive way, and I will start appending values to my list. That's it. Nothing else. You can even copy similar implementation of this argument parsing. You don't need to worry much about it. OK, fair enough. 
then it thought, okay, I will just run it to see. You can see there the timing for a non-recursive of, uh, I think, of a directory with 1,000 files, and then inside each file has 1,000 more. So you can see the values there. They are, in a non-recursive way, FastGlove is really fast. In a recursive way, also it's still really fast. This is not really a fair comparison, of course. Glob and Padlib are written in C, uh, sorry, in Python, and this implementation is written in C++. So there is some performance gain there just for changing the language. But I just wanted to show you that only with a couple of lines you can expose this little functionality in C++ and create your own module. This is really cool, right? So I thought, okay, let's continue. This was looking good, so I thought I will do the same with mathematical functions. Same structure as before. This should be not different for you. I thought, okay, I will implement my own square root function that accept a list of numbers. Here I thought, okay, only a C implementation. I create a list and then I have the main loop where I kind of get the item from the list, transform it into double, set it in my list, and that's it. Simple enough. But then I thought, maybe I can use a C++ uh, feature. And there is a nice function called transform. Transform will graph the elements of a vector and put it into another vector with a certain lambda function there that I am using to transform the values. Since I'm saying C++ vector, I needed to copy the Python, as you can see here, the, the Python list to standard vector first and afterwards. And I am allowing the threads to get some, maybe some performance. Okay, that's it. And for the execution, I thought, okay, easy, I will get the last, the last one as the best function. So using the math, square root function there, you see, okay, 3.64, and then you have here, the C implementation is 1.74, okay, and this one, 2. what? You can see why this is even better, the, the other one, without the C++. You can see that here, the problem was that I was transforming this Python object into a C++ vector, and that was using a lot of time. The process itself, the transform, take this compared to this time in microseconds. It's way better, but since you are also copying things around, it was really not worth it. So in this case, it didn't work as we planned, but at least we know that uh, there were some external cost of copying things around. Okay, don't get too depressed with those results. I promise you that now there are cooler examples. So we saw the first scenario. I wrote all the code by myself in SimPython. But is that the only way? No, it's not. There are many, many tools that allow you to run, uh, 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 expose a whole C++ project into Python. And for that, I'm sorry for the self-promotion, but on the same topic of interaction with C++ and Python and gave a talk at the EuroPython to review many, many of those tools and how easy they are to use it. You can find here in the material, even the, in, also there is a repo there with uh, how to use a simple uh, library and how to expose it with the different tools that are there. So I, if you're interested in generating automatic bindings from C++ or C projects, I recommend you to, to keep a look at it. Okay, enough with the sale promotion. This is the most interesting scenario. We still have some time and I was rushing because I really wanted for you to enjoy this last bit because these examples are really, really cool. This is the other case. Now it's not C++ helping Python, but Python helping C++. We will do two things. The first one will be uh, adding <clears throat> a simple example of how to embed a Python interpreter inside a C++ code. It sounds really complicated, right? It's not. And the second one, will be to grab a functioning desktop application, graphical application, written in C++, and embed Python on it, and trying to see if we can get no new functionalities from the, from the, from the tool. Okay, for the embedding, believe it or not, you just need a couple of things. First of all, you include the Python headers. Second, in your main, you will do initialization of Python. The same way you will have a finalize. And that's it. It's embedded already. 
And here, if you want to try, for example, I can try simple string and then run something at like uh, hello. Don't believe me. This here is a file that I prepare for you. Same with idea. I'm just setting now the, the name of the project. But then once I compile this, then I have it. And if you don't believe me, here you can see how the lib Python is linked to this binary called main, besides all the other C and C++ things. For building this project, it's not the setup.py. I use a small CMake file, which is also is, is quite a simple couple of lines that you can copy around and see, but it is just the idea of adding to the linking process uh, the Python libraries. And that will be it. So hmm, with this in mind, then you know that embedding Python in any C++ existing application will be really, really cool and easy to do. So let's jump into it. <clears throat> this is, a, I think, that uh, one of the most important examples that we have in the Good for Python project which is embedding the interpreter in an existing C++ application. So here we have many files, don't get scared. I want to first highlight it, like how this thing with Qt works. So I have here an empty window example, just to show you more or less how the Python code looks. You, you will import some stuff, whatever. You will declare an application, create a window, add maybe some components to the window, show the window and start the application and with the loop that will be running all the time. Simple enough, right? So you have the, here is our application, our beautiful application, see? The hello message is there. And the same way, you can add, maybe put everything inside a class to have something more understandable. As you can see here, same idea. I create application, window, do some precise, and show. In this case, I am using a class to do everything and I am adding a button and then I am connecting the bottom action of clicking the button to a print. So here I have it, our beautiful application. And every time that I click, I get a click message. Okay, so this is this common structure of writing any Qt application, both in C++ and in Python. So now that we know that, we have here a huge application that we will, for example, this is the main of the C++. Quite similar to what you saw, you have, okay, this is nothing new to you that now you are proficient in C++. You have your main, an application, a window, you are showing the window and running the application. Everything is fine so far. The main window class, again, don't be scared about all these macros. It will be a class that it will have a constructor, some functions, more functions, and some attributes. Okay, so how this thing works? First, I will hide something that I wanted to show you before. So you are not, so I execute this application, as you can see here, really simple application. One of the first thing that you notice is that, okay, there's a run button, implement the right run, this gets updated, and here I'm executing Python code. So there is an uh, implementation to en enable the option to write, uh, execute Python code that is inside here. One of the first thing that you can see there is that uh, you cannot see anything because it's kind of small, right? So let's go and in Python code, we can, <coughs> change the fonts in different ways. I will just style sheets is faster. I will use font size 30. Boom. There you have it. I From Python, I am changing the behavior and the state of the C++ application that is already running. This is being done because we are exposing the C++ object main window to Python land, and we can access it and interact with it. So then you can think, hmm, if I can have access to this, I can do many other fun things, right? So what I wanted to do since we just changed the color is that we can maybe, since this is a little bit ugly in the interface, create somehow as the idea of a dark mode of the of the interface. So for this, uh, we can, for example, let's use the same style sheet. And let's say, let's keep the font in 20. 
we will say that the background color is, is a dark gray for example let's use say a a7 and let's say that the color uh, is black well in this case no this is not the proper color we will have here okay no let's use this color better so 31 36 and 3b yeah sorry i was creating like a light mode then but no in any case uh white so in this case we will have the option hopefully to change some color let's see Ooh, yes so this is a dark mode already but uh, the problem is that okay i keep running it and i need to remove it now well and then i cannot go back right so maybe we can implement something a little bit more smarter maybe we can add a button here that is called dark mode and add some functionality right so i also prefer for you a plugin that kind of follows the same idea we will do the imports we will declare a global variable there and a function that it will you know see if it's dark mode or not and change the colors and stuff but the most important part is this part here we are getting the toolbar with the buttons that you got from the main window we are adding a new action called dark mode creating one we are adding it to the toolbar and then we are saying every time that someone click it or trigger it let's call this function so um i implemented and for you for you to play around with it uh, that every time that you have a plugins directory there it will be automatically load so let's see plugin load dark mode dot pi okay and then we have our interface and we have our button see easy enough so imagine all the possibilities you can have so you can maybe if you know some c++ piece of software that needs a little bit of improvement maybe you can implement a plugin system for an existing c++ application okay what now first of all i hope that after this talk you are not afraid of c++ anymore there are many amazing features that have a little bit of python flavor on it and i am really happy about it also keep an eye on what is happening in other languages even if you don't know that language read the updates read the news and see which kind of features we can maybe bring to python because of course we need to start bringing with all these new things to python to make it even better language right so and unfortunately you don't need to pick only one language here you can start combining whatever you want in your stack and hopefully after this talk you will be more aware of what is happening in other languages and help us and help everyone even yourself to improve what python is today so i really hope that you enjoy this thing you are not too afraid of c you know that we can interact with this in different many ways uh, so if you're interested on the topic send me a message you can find me there uh, we can change some emails and stuff and i am really looking forward to hear what you think about c implementation that uh, maybe the latest features are kind of nice and you want to give it a try i'm totally up for start helping you on learning and jumping into writing your own c modules and of course if at some point you are in berlin please let me know we can have a beer too we have an amazing python community here with many groups and maybe you can have a beer while enjoying one of the meetups or many groups here in berlin so hopefully you can have a nice morning afternoon or evening thank you very much